they always like throw like the community under the bus. The community does something, right? And then the, Adobe goes like, that's a great idea. We're going to do it our own version. So now whatever you were doing for months or for years as, as a product. Mm -hmm. So it's still, what it's doing essentially is getting all those heroes in the community the people that are shouting out about the product about cfml about everything else and just throws them under the bus because now adobe does it a different way so we have you talking about like the cf setup versus the cf config yeah yeah exactly cold fusion alive the podcast for the cold fusion community discover practices tools techniques tips and trends for modern cold fusion development Brought to you by TerraTech, the Cold Fusion experts. Develop, secure, optimize. Here is your host, the founder of TerraTech, Michaela Light. So, welcome back to the show. I'm here with a whole bunch of Cold Fusion experts here. We've got Charlie. Mark, Gert, and Ben, and myself. And we're going to be talking about Adobe Cold Fusion and Lucy, the two leading Cold Fusion engines, or CFML engines, as I should say, before I get beaten up by one of the CFML hardcore people. Um, and we're going to look at some of the different ways they are the same or uh, alike and uh, compare and contrast them. So, welcome, guys. Welcome, Thank you, Mark. Guys. Hello, welcome. And just in case anyone listening or watching this doesn't know who these are, Charlie Earhart is an amazing Cold Fusion troubleshooter. Mark Drew is uh, really dedicated to solving difficult Cold Fusion problems in the United Kingdom. <laughs> uh, well, and worldwide, I think. Uh, Gert Franz is located somewhere in the center of Europe, uh, I think Switzerland, I want to say, uh, and is a uh, leading light in the Lucy community. And Ben Nadell comes to us from, I believe, New York. So, yep. uh, and he publishes pretty much every single day. I don't know how you find time to do any work, Ben. <laughs> he, his Ben Nadell blog is one of the most popular Cold Fusion blogs out there. So, I want to say most popular blogs on the internet. <laughs> oh, well, yes. I mean, never mind Cold Fusion, it's just, it's just popular. Yes. Like, That's I've right. been looking for like various different things online unrelated to technology. Ben Nadell comes uh, up, so I gotta, I he brings me angle. joy every day. Thank you. <laughs> so let, let's start off by looking at how Adobe uh, CF 2021 and Lucy 5.3, how they compare for ease of programming and CFML this year. Um, I'm going to have to jump out of the, the, the Adobe side um and, or maybe stake my 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 bad claim is that i don't really know much about uh adobe core fusion for the last five six years since i have haven't used it so well, that's okay ben and charlie have been using it <laughs> i'm hoping so. that they can bring yeah, in yeah, some more information i mean just to clarify to the audience mark, mark and gert are more on the lucy side of things uh yeah. ben and charlie are more on the, the adobe cold fusion th side of things but you know they both have uh they do lucy stuff yeah. too as do uh, i you know i have to also so. say you know i have to also say uh if you're selling a bmw i can't drive a mercedes so i have to drive the bmw <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, yeah, I and that's so, why we've got a round table instead of having a, a regular absolutely. podcast episode so we can bring all different views to the table. So uh, what do you guys think about uh, the ease of programming in CFML? I mean, I think it's amazing, honestly. I, uh, I, I primarily code in Cold Fusion on the server side and then JavaScript on the client side. And what I'm noticing more and more is that uh, the syntax for the two languages are kind of converging, at least with my particular style. So it's uh, it's actually a really small shift mentally to go from client side to server side. You know, you're maybe adding some type checking and some slightly different data types, but it's it's ultimately objects and arrays and strings and looping over stuff and concatenating stuff and mapping and filtering and and. Uh, I just love kind of how the modernization of the cold fusion language is making it look more and more like everything else that I use, which is just ease of transition. So that's been really, really great. 
I think I have a question even... there for you. Hang on, I have a question there for you, Ben. Have you experienced that as well? That you have um, code that on the client side that is used, let's say jQuery, JavaScript, whatever, and your clients love that, but on the server side, <laughs> they still stick to tag-based code. And I'm not able to convince them to go to scripts because they say, well, it's way too complicated and I can't use it. And I go, but it's the same. I mean, it's, yeah, you literally copy and paste and add some, uh, some public and yeah, private yeah. and some return types. Absolutely. Uh, I Absolutely. think what, what's Sorry, kind of, uh, and I'm, this is a controversial opinion, and that's why we're having this roundtable, right, for the controversial opinions. I think CFML or Lucy CFML on the server side is much better than Node on the server side, even though like you've got JavaScript on the front end and the back end. And I've, I've written in all of these languages in different contexts. And the problem with Node on the server side is that you're doing paradigms that you do for the client on this event base and you've got closures and you've got all, all of the, 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 the paradigms that you need for uh, an async model of, of a client which you're then having to do on the server side where you don't really have that async model because you have a request that you're processing. And this is where Lucy on the server side makes a lot more sense, like all the CFML on the server side, than, it, than using Node, which I'll be using for you know, full stack engineers, which are doing JavaScript in client and JavaScript on, on server. Yeah, I 100% agree. I, I like to think of called fusion as blocking by default and asynchronous when you need it mm -hmm. because the reality is blocking code it's just much easier to read and to reason about which is why even on the javascript side we've moved from callbacks and even just raw promises to a lot of async await notation right that makes the asynchronous code read like synchronous code so cfml we just get that by default and then if you need to run things asynchronously obviously we have uh, the async iteration, which by the way, is one of the coolest things about cold fusion, being able to map and filter and reduce asynchronously. Yeah. Uh, you have your CF threads, you have your scheduled tasks, you have all the asynchronous functionality that you need, but only when you need it. And you have that ease of, of blocking by default with everything else. I totally agree. And I have to also say, Cold Fusion has, has a long history now for 20 years, 25 years, actually, or 27 years, actually. And over those 27 years, if I remember where it started with CF Script um, and where it now came to and how we can use it now, um, in my opinion, it is the absolute preferred way of doing it. And uh, I very rarely jump out of um, CF Script to go back into tag. Mainly, we only do that for for view model for the, for the view yeah. layer and even in the view layer i tend to write cf script just because it prevents generating white space and everything and i sometimes even use this triple tick notation just to jump inside of script into tag and back because i'm just too lazy to um to well <laughs> nest it and do an include or whatever so sometimes inside in a cf mail where i write the mail in script I inside there do a triple tick with a tag notation then uh, because that sometimes and really only in one or two cases makes more sense to write it in tag. Anyway, so I prefer script over everything. I think the only problem with preferring script is that the tools haven't quite advanced to that. And says Mark, who wrote Cypher Clips and with other people, uh, is that you don't get enough syntax help on cf script because actually doing tag parsing is a lot easier in editors than than script parsing right and th this is i think that's what's blocking the community getting much more into that because they're not getting all the help as you type well maybe charlie you know that um is since cold fusion is supporting statics as well is there any support for additional uh, code formatting, code support in VS Code or Sublime uh, since CF 2021? Well, actually, that's a good point to take a moment. First of all, am I breaking up? Because you guys were breaking up, and I think I was having something go crazy on my end. But do I good. sound okay? Yeah, okay, good. brilliant. Um, actually, before I answer your question, I want to just go back quickly to something that Ben had said. Um, CFML, you know, the, the evolution of the language, that was great point that 
he's he brought up and you guys have expanded on. And I just wanted to say that um, a year, I think a year ago, maybe two years ago, I did a talk on um, cold fusion at 25, more modern than most realize. And I've just put a link to that. So folks listening, um, Michaela will be sure at the end that we have show notes and we have links to lots of stuff in there. And, um, you know, Ben had mentioned um, async and that's a feature of both. And and I'll get back to what you'd ask, but I just wanted to get this out before we lose track of it. The language has evolved so much and both languages. And at first, so often it's been Lucy pushing first for things to be in there first, and then Adobe will be picking up afterwards. Sometimes it's been the other way around, but, um, but I mean, so much, you know, um, closures and promises, as you mentioned, and async and lambdas and fat arrow functions and higher order functions, functional programming, just so many things that people would often not think CF. And when I say CF, you know, we, we, we're saying CF generically now, CFML, the language, which is a, a misnomer, right? Because we're talking about CS script, which is a markup language. But anyway, the, it's just evolved so much. And it's too bad that people often regard it as old and dated. And, and it is older, and therefore it's got stuff that's legacy. It gets brought forward. And we all come across code that you know looks like it hasn't changed in 20 years. But man, if people want to, they can make it be as modern as they want. And so that that talk gets into that in much more detail. But back to the editors, that was a great point too that you were bringing up is that, you know, in the old days, you know, we had Homesite Plus and Cold Fusion Studio, and then people would choose maybe um, Sublime or Notepad++. And then of course, VS Code went crazy and took over the world. And there are multiple CFML extensions but I think your question maybe was about uh, Adobe's plans for supporting um, VS Code. And yeah. they've been talking for about a year of plans to rewrite what we regard as CF Builder on VS Code. And those plans are you know, still in the works. It hasn't happened yet. Mark Takata- I was right? promised Q2. Yes. So Michaela had a talk. Wait, with hang on. Him. Which year? Which year? Uh, <laughs> this year. It was supposed to come out end of last year, but they had yes. some stuff all got stuff delayed. Up with that log four J issue and, and yeah. various Threw other them things. Off. And but now they said they'd have it out by the end of Q two. I think they want to have it ready for C oh other news related yeah. to both Lucy and Adobe Cold Fusion is uh, the Adobe CF Summit is happening in person in Las Vegas in I think September or is it October? No, it's beginning of October. So that oh. news just came out um too. And my guess is they ought they definitely want to have it available before CF Summit. And they're probably going to have the whatever they're going to call it, Cold Fusion 2021, 2023. I guess it's the next version. They haven't named it though. So, um, and we know they changed the name of 2020 to 2021. So we'll see what version, but they're already working on the alpha of that. And I, I'm sure they'll have announcements about it at CF Summit. So, I have big problems with that attitude. You know, like there's a commercial versus open source attitude. There is a big plugin mm -hmm. that like nearly all CFML developers use that's been added and called Adobe keeps on doing this which is, oh, we're going to build our own tools so we can sell it, rather than going like, well, we've got the whole power of, of an engineering team. Why don't we contribute to something that's already built? And I keep on seeing this again and again and again. It's people, let's go and build our own thing, and then we're going to do it. Instead of contributing to what's already built, add to it, you know, expand upon it. You know, we already have a tool that we're using, right? Is like you we could add it like cf eclipse same thing with cf eclipse they went to do cf builder and look how popular that was you know it's like fantastic yeah, maybe growth, maybe there needs know. to be a change in mindset at adobe i mean to be fair to them they have to have a model that produces bucket loads of money to pay for all those developers <laughs> they have out in bangalore bangalore uh india and the other sure, stuff but, that, the but world, that's so. that, that's not going to be an editor like is it going to be an editor licenses really how much can you charge for an editor I, that's the microsoft model you know, Mark, it's they not. give away, I mean, like they VS give away code the .net is... and they charge seats for the editor. They don't. I understand. Like VS Code is they don't free. Charge seats like, for the... Visual Basic they charge, Studio they is charge free. Some... I apologize. They charge some big fee for something. Microsoft doesn't give away all of the .NET ecosystem for free. I know because I've talked to people who use it and they're writing checks sure. for ten to $20,000 um, a year. 
And I have to also say, I have to also say, if I'm taking part of Adobe here, um, Adobe actually tries to lock in folks into Adobe Cold Fusion and not into Lucy. So if they contribute, they actually support the Lucy community as well. From their perspective, I understand that. From my perspective, it makes no sense. And I'm, I'm com completely agreeing with Mark there. But I can understand it from the corporate perspective, definitely. So, yeah. Yes, but no, you're trying to grow a community, right? So you already charge for the licensing. So to go to your point, Michaela, which is a, a Microsoft model, they're already charging thousands and thousands of dollars for licenses, right? Mm -hmm. The the editors... Well, for basically, for the Windows license and for the SQL Server license, you typically have to have if you run .NET. So. For sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm, and and for Adobe, like for for selling Cold Fusion enterprise licenses, Cold Fusion stand licenses, I don't even know what the pricing is. They're already charging for that, right? So, mm -hmm. like, but but what you're doing is the editor would be an advertising kind of cost, right? It's like saying like yeah. you get them in and you and you can do uh, great if I install I don't know Cold Fusion free version, whichever the Express or whatever the their version is f to get people trying it out the first the, the thing you're going to need is dev an editor and dev staging and test licenses are free if you're using right. it in education for teaching it's free if you're using education for actually do anything it's not free right that's their free licensing and i i think it's i'd agree different. there they don't push their free licenses enough they they should definitely have a free level that they try and inf you know get everyone excited about cold fusion so um i would agree with yeah and so like what's the first thing that you do after you have that license after you've like pressed start mm -hmm. core fusion server mm -hmm. it's like edit it with text pad or something or you or if you're a developer already you could use vs code because you're already using vs code or yeah. whatever editor that was out there and now you yeah, have to this, go oh i have to like use half a dozen or a dozen different edit there's a hard, no there's yeah. about a dozen six to 12 editors i've seen on the state of the cold fusion user server right. that folks use the number one is vs code and using the free add-ons for that i don't know exactly what's going to be in this adobe builder thing because they haven't really announced all the features but i assume it's going to have things like breakpoints and debugging and all kinds of other fancy stuff it won't just be syntax highlighting so whether people sure. want to pay for that or not i don't know but that is a good point um there is a difference between open source and closed source. And, and is it, it's not just difference in pricing, it's a difference in mentality, you know, I think, mm -hmm. you know, it yeah. is, you can, you can say that very simply from the different comments that we got over the years. So for the, for example, when we bring out the open source version of Lucy five or five, one, two, three, whatever, or six, when it comes, people are asking, when is this feature coming? Right? Well, the thing is this, if you're, not contributing to the whole thing or you write a pull request or you actually secure funding for something i'm sorry but we're all working here more or less for free we have to do some other work or we have to rely on our on our lucy association to to fund some of those things and they are just simple prioritization mm -hmm. and sometimes i'm sorry but cf report we can't do it for several reasons first of all way too big second of all it is a proprietary format by Adobe, and it's closed source, so we can't adhere that. Uh, we can't do work. that. I'm, or, I'm, I'm working on them to open up CF Report because they've abandoned the product. They should just release that as open source and let right. people who want there it you go. maintain there you go. it. Yeah. You know, I mean, because they, but, they, but they that's have what no I meant. desire to add it back in as far as I know. Either they should add it back in and support it. I mean, it was written in Delphi, for God's sake, which is a dead language. I right? know Delphi. That was my first. <laughs> oh, well, then we're going we're gonna to bring you in. Yeah. to tweak it back up but there's definitely a small number of cfers who have lots of cf reports and would love to see it come back and maybe they have money to pay for that i don't know I um, this podcast is brought to you by terratech the cold fusion experts develop secure optimize get detailed show notes on today's episode and your free cf alive modern cold fusion guide at terratech.com that is t-e-r-a-t-e-c-h dot c-o-m and now back to today's show and i um, just interject with one thing about the open source mentality and and one of the things that i really appreciate about lucy as an ecosystem is not just that the source code is open source which is really amazing for debugging 
but the the process around the product development feels very open source as well. I think we've all run into situations where you post a bug in the Adobe bug base, and then just months later, they'll close it as not going to fix it. And you're like, uh, what? <laughs> Whereas with Lucy, there's a, a Jira project and you can go in there and you can actually see the conversation happening about why something is or isn't valid. And then uh, Mika, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right, like actually has to come sure. in and validate and justify why he doesn't want to fix something or he does want to fix something. And then there can be a conversation about it. And it's not just, it's not just that the product is open source, but the whole product life cycle is open source. And that's very, very comforting, I think. And I have to admit that we have some bugs in there that are a couple of years old as well, <laughs> right? But if it says something like, okay, well, CF Exchange not supported. Mm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the, the way I see it is, is, is simply like open source is a kind of democracy in, in the sense that, hey, you're interested in CF report just because that's the topic at hand, right? It's, it's like, yeah, but there's two of you. I mean, you can be really loud about it, but there's two of you compared to the thousands of people that really don't give a damn about CF report because you've moved on to use Redash or any other solution for doing reports because since then, a million solutions have come to light. Like, uh, I'm on a hit on features that I can just off the top of my head PDF generation, right? I know that, uh, you know, Cold Fusion that was their jam and, and everything else. And you go, like, well, yeah, sure, but I'm pretty sure Adobe sells some really good PDF generation software that at an enterprise level, that's what you'd be using. You wouldn't be using a website server language to generate it right now i'm sure there's very a million reasons why you'd want to do that or how you integrate it but i'm pretty sure there's like more enterprisey kind of solutions yeah they that. they have a pdf thing i forget what it's called maybe charlie you know the name of it but yeah acrobat um, or something but, but yeah no it's got some other name but um you know, a lot of Cold Fusion developers do use the PDF features in Adobe Cold Fusion. Yep. Lucy developers have some libraries they can use to do the same thing. Um, so, but I think you bring up a great point, uh, Gert and Mark, about how do you prioritize new features? And it's not just, I mean, yes, it is a democracy, but also even in the Lucy world, if someone joins Lucy Association and ponies up 5,000 bucks or whatever, they can say, yeah, my vote's bigger and I do want this feature. Mm -hmm. And you guys, yeah. oh, guys, okay, adding that into the language. And if the well, feature makes sense for the language, it'll go into the main language. If it's like some weird corner case, then maybe it's just a special version for them. Well, how we do this is actually a little different. Um, mm. We're the the um, open source version, uh, and that where Misha spends half of his time is just der derived by whatever is in the bug base. Many of the features that we build are built from commercial um, hiring of um, the company Razia, where I'm uh, working at. And um, so, for example, let's just take a specific example. We're creating a, a um, a new tag called distributed lock, right? Distributed lock allows you to lock a request over, let's say, across a, a bunch of servers. We're using some messaging queue for that in order to make sure that that is not happening, that, that that request runs solely on one system. That is not going into the main language because we cannot do that for everyone out there because there might be completely different requirements for, for this type of thing. So what we do in that ex in that case, we build an extension, and that extension is something that you can just install wherever you need it, and you lock it down to the customers that you you need it. It's not commercially licensed unless the client who financed it desires it. And in my uh, in my opinion, Adobe does the same same thing. If a huge client says we need this, we're going to invest in this, we're going to like, I don't know, let's take CF Client, right? CF Client wasn't built because they just thought this is the greatest thing that we need to do. I'm pretty sure there was a client behind that funding the whole thing and saying, this is what we need. If you build it, we're going to buy so and so many licenses. That's at least how I assume it. I'm not in Adobe headquarters, but I would do it the same way in the open source uh, community. What we do is we have a voting mechanism on the um, on the Jira bug report system as well, and the ones that are most popular or our security issues. So there are a couple of 
different levels of importance of tickets, um, they get prioritized, right? And then what falls through the cracks is sometimes uh, um, a bigger discussion and some folks get very loud about things, right? Sometimes. I, I think one other key thing on any language is you've got to have someone or some peoples who decide what makes sense to, to put it to the language because it's so easy to look just look at what happened to microsoft word not that that's a language but it turned into the kitchen sink and became impossible to use or very hard to use because they added every single feature everyone asked for and one of the great things about lucy and adobe Core Fusion is there's some discipline about well does this make sense does it should we implement this in an easy way for people to use and understand so, yeah. and I think that's important because it's so easy to get language bloat. And, and that's exactly the reason why we introduced these things like extensions, where you can just say, mm -hmm. okay, the bare core minimum is really very hard to, uh, well, only if there are really big basic changes, like for Lucy 6, we're introducing things like event-driven mm -hmm. um, procedural things, right? That is baked into the native language. But if you have some exotic things, like this mm -hmm. distributed lock that's an extension and if uh, folks are using it a lot it might make its way into the main language but it might also not right so well now we've been having a little bit of more controversial discussion uh maybe we should switch to something even more controversial which is licensing <laughs> <laughs> i don't know if charlie you've been quiet a bit maybe you like to say a little bit about licensing between the two and Oh, I was only being quiet because I was enjoying the conversation, you know, because I've always <laughs> loved listening to all you guys. For those who don't know, we've all known each other for over 20 years. We'll just say over 20 years. Yeah. And so we, we've all known well, each other. Great, Many of us met in 1999 <laughs> in the Washington, D.C. at the first CF United under a different name it had back then. Charlie yeah. was the most dedicated speaker. He's been speaking <laughs> like 22, I, more than 20, yeah, 23 I, years you've been speaking publicly on cold fusion i think so. in fact one of anyway, the very first presentations i ever did was at the uh maryland cold fusion user group that you ran and that was back in go. probably 98 97 98 yeah. holy cow well, anyway <laughs> anyway anyway let's talk about the licensing differences obviously lucy is open source and free i, I assume there's no circumstance where you have to pay a license fee for lucy is it, well okay, there is one if you hang oh. on there is one oh if you require a closed source version like some companies oh. require they can hire our company and we then create a specific version for them which is closed source right and which we then of course are taking over license. the guarantees and what have you and uh, they pay a license fee and okay. um that has well, every a few times uh, in the past all of usually regular, you don't yeah all the regular people whether you're in the cloud on premises running on your own servers whatever you yeah. don't have to pay doesn't matter license. Yeah. I had a, a million, a million servers running lucy and you wouldn't be paying a license no. fee you might be no. paying a support contract to get yeah. help or critical or participating in, in the lucy association as a member that is always very helpful but we're not get, we're good singers but we're not getting rich you know so <laughs> ironically yeah, Mark, in, that, in that vein was that i had a a company when I was working on CF Eclipse uh, asking me to sell them a whole bunch of licenses. And I said, like, but it's free. It's open source and free. I mean, I can't sell you. Then And they, they said, no, 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 no. We, we're going to send you a purchase order and you have to send us an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I didn't have a company or anything. I said, I'm just a guy that works on the project. So, yeah, I, I had to give a, a very major company a, a, an invoice for zero dollars for infinite licenses and i guess it was part of the due diligence um thing so i should have maybe done what gert says you know like oh yes i'll give you a closed source version there you go excellent money <laughs> and mark at least you could offer them a refund if they're unhappy right yeah i have offered refunds for for open source before so. i think one of the yeah. biggest barriers to entry though for cold fusion at least on the adobe side has been that there's never been a free model or a freemium model that, I mean, you can develop for free, but the barrier to entry for a developer who wants to experiment with it is you either have to uh, uh, get your company to pay for it, which, you know, if you're just experimenting, it's probably not going to be a thing, or you have to, you know, pay a, like a minimum of what is it, like $1,900 now, even just for a standard mm -hmm. license. 2,500 like, is the minimum. Yeah. Standard. I mean, 
I don't want to throw judgment. But I, but that's I'm just crazy. Slightly, I I agree. Having a freemium or a free thing is a, a great way to get people into it. And I just want to point out, you can you don't have to buy a Cold Fusion license yourself. You can go to a hosting company, right? But and you but just even pay that. for the month by the month. And you can even, or you can, I mean, you're going to have to go. Typically, everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people use a hosting company. So if you're running Lucy, you're running Adobe, you're paying a monthly fee for the hosting. Mm-hmm. Now, the monthly fee yeah. for a Lucy hosting is usually less than that for Adobe hosting, but it's not like yeah. gold. And what you could do for, and what you could do as well is you can definitely start your own at, uh, Amazon Web Services called Fusion Server, which costs mm-hmm. you monthly as well, right? So yeah. you don't have to. That's a monthly like, option but, they have. There are other business models around this, and like in in the game mm-hmm. industry, for example, uh, Epic, who you might have heard uh, do an Unreal Engine, you can use and publish games on it, which is kind of like to, to Ben's point. It's like I want to play around with it, and when I say play around, I want to put something on the web, like I want to make a business right on the web, whatever that business is, selling widgets, it's my new Twitter clone, whatever, but. For example, Epic don't charge you any money until you make a revenues over a hundred thousand dollars, and then they take a cut of your percentage. And then if you make a lot more, then you can start doing deals with them about how much you pay for licensing. And that's a kind of better model. That's like saying if you succeed, we succeed. So therefore, you've got this kind of yeah, we're going to support you as much as you know to get you to that level. Because it's a kind of unfair, like mom and pop shop. I don't know. I've never met a mom and pop shop, but they use this called Fusion. But I'm sure there's one there that no, are doing there's plenty out there. Oh, there's plenty out there, but they got to pay. What I, I'm sorry, I don't know the prices. Like five grand for your for your um, enterprise for your Core Fusion enterprise, because that's the kind of traffic they get compared to Boeing or some other massive company. That five grand to them is literally nothing. That's like. You know, okay, fine, whatever. Like to be honest, we've just spent more money trying to raise a purchase order than than you did on the actual price of the license, right? In in those kind of companies, so that's kind of, in my opinion, slightly unfair. Yeah, sure, it's it's market economics and and everything else, but hey, but there I is think that's an interesting. I I think that's an interesting idea, though. I am going to say that Adobe do a little bit of that, and Charlie has written about this with their SaaS licensing thing if you have a SaaS written in cold fusion they want to extract extra fees which i think is a mistake myself yeah, I agree. I, I, I agree. um and they will they will negotiate it away if you're not making a lot of money on your SaaS. but it's very hard people get upset when you start taking money away from their profits so i mean my personal philosophical view is a programming language let you build anything you want and the program the, co- the company or open source community that makes that programming language should be completely neutral about what you write in it it shouldn't be their concern. Once mm-hmm. you've sold the programming language or you've downloaded it, if it's open source, it's up to the programmer what they program in it. And it's not the programming. Here's the important point. It's not the programming creator's responsibility, what programs are written in it, or what bugs they have and what, you know, what is get. I, I won't give all the dire things people could do in programming languages and have done, but it shouldn't mm-hmm. be the programming language creator's responsibility either for the profits or for dire consequences of what is done with that. Okay. Uh, I think there should be a separation between the two. And yeah. this Adobe idea totally of doing agree. SaaS licensing is a big mistake in my view. Right. Yeah, I mean, on the other hand, it brought us a lot of new clients, so that's not a good thing. So. <laughs> well, and, and but, before we but move wait. On- Wait, okay. I have still, still something regarding yeah. client licenses. The thing is... Yeah. Um, there is a benefit in having uh, licenses that cost money. Cold Fusion users are used to pay money. Mm-hmm. So um, that is not something, you know, when you, when you go into a PHP community or into any other mm-hmm. open source community, they're not used to pay money for something. So uh, folks are so used to it that folks here on this call, or at least one guy, is able to charge per minute, right? Which is a great thing. Right, and I, I think Charlie, you're doing an amazing job there. So I don't, I, do, I don't do the for a minute. You. That was a long time ago. Well, you did it. I'm sorry. Let I did. That's right. One time. Yeah, per 15 minutes troubleshooting, Charlie, help. Yes, yes. That, yeah, that's what I do. And you're right. And people are willing to. And that was a good point, Gert, is that people are um, generally more willing to pay for things in much of the CF community, and that benefits the people that create monitoring tools and other sorts of tools and 
there is mm-hmm. that difference in, in communities where everything was free. It's kind of hard to get them to pay for anything. Um, I wanted to say a couple things. One is, you know, some people are probably wondering, why don't we have an Adobe person on to speak? And of course, we reached out and, and offered that opportunity. And they're always reticent, I think, to get into such debates over licensing and probably to even, you know, have discussions about Lucy. So we, you know, we couldn't, and I'm not, I'm not an Adobe person. I, I'm not representing Adobe. I don't make money if people buy Cold Fusion or, you know, you I support play people one on the TV, TV, Charlie. You don't play an Adobe, you don't That's play right. an Adobe person on TV. <laughs> you could think that. So I wanted to make sure that was clear. And I support people that run Lucy. And then as Michaela said, I do support, you know, troubleshooting support. So whatever people use, I'm happy to help. And it's, you know, 99% CF and Lucy people. And um, anyway, so uh, what I wanted to let us not forget about, um, oh, back to the, the question of licensing. You know, that was a great point that Michaela made. You know, for a lot of people, this isn't as big a deal as it is to some because they don't pay for it. There are people that use even Adobe Cold Fusion. And don't pay for it, A, because they work somewhere where someone does, or B, they do hosting and maybe it's really cheap and it's not even worth worrying about the cost at that point. But 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 where things I think are becoming particularly sensitive is in the move to microservices or just you know deployment in the cloud, let's say on Docker images. And we'll talk about Docker images later, but both CF and Lucy support Docker images. And man, when you want to spin up, you know, more than a couple instances, that's when the pain really hits you with CF's licensing. And I just so wish they will address that soon because that's that's a real killer. And that's what really I'm gonna does have drive. to say I'm gonna have to say the C word at this point, Charlie, which is cause. <laughs> There's a <laughs> cause licensing clause. How many cores does your CPU have? And on cloud, that could be, I mean, modern servers have 16, 32 cores. And right. Cold Fusion's like, oh, you well, you, you get two cores. You know, I mean, right. for and, and here's standard. a problem. It's like, ridiculous. I'm not sure how, like, as an example, we run some Kubernetes clusters, right? And we scale pods out dynamically from pod right. being a Docker container, right? Like from like five to a hundred over a period of time, right? Mm-hmm. Now, those are just Docker containers running on a certain number of nodes, which are machines, which are virtual machines. So like it's now so abstracted. It's like if 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 someone comes and says, like, so licensing, give me the licensing. I'm like, I don't quite know. I mean, I know that the nodes have like 32 cores on them, but I don't know how many pods run on it. Right. So we know how many pods, but we have no idea how many cores. And that's what I was getting at. Is that right. that's where I was about to say that's what's really driving, I think, a lot of people to move to Lucy recently is they want to do deployment in Docker or Kubernetes, whatever uh, containerized environment mm-hmm. they want, want to run in. And that license just does not work. And just quickly, um, for those who don't know, you know, I did a blog post on this a couple of years ago because it is documented. Adobe, they license, they allow you to run up to eight containers with an enterprise license, but it's one container per standard license and so you know that that's crazy too but but even the eight alone you know that, that let me be clear eight, eight containers could satisfy some people's needs it gives them lots of room for you know reliability not so much for scalability but i just wanted to say that that was my point earlier is that to me that they i wish they would fix that i've been complaining about that for the since i wrote that blog post where i found that information it's like oh my gosh really come on that's not gonna work and so you know again that's driving people who are able to, to just say, well, never mind, I'm just going to use Lucy and not have to pay for it. So that's, you know, it is what it is. And I don't know if they're going to change it. It's it's partly, it's not just that they don't want to pay for it. It's just the licensing is too complicated, Yeah, you know, and it's, and and it's not kept up with modern tendencies. Absolutely. It's got to change. Partly I've talked to the Adobe guys and it's partly a technical issue. How do you charge per hour or minute of CPU, whatever? And that can be solved. That's a technical issue. Definitely that's solvable. You've got to understand Adobe is an enormous corporation and they've got a big legal department and you've got to get these quill pen work. I'm exaggerating here, guys. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, they're like, I, I I imagine there are all these Victorian lawyers in, in morning coats and top hats and quill pens. And like, What's this cloud thing? I don't know. We can't do that. You know, and they need to <laughs> wait. I want to slap them and wait, you know, wake up, guys. It's 2022. Amazon, Google, 
Microsoft are all running cloud services. They're all charging by the hour for their services. Mm -hmm. They've effing figured it out. Why can't Adobe figure it out? Yeah, Mm -hmm. I mean, and we're being a bit unfair because... (laughs) We are talking. I get upset about this, Mark. Then, uh, I no, it's, it's fine. Fun- I, I and- agree with you. I agree with you 100%. And the, the thing, the, I think we're being unfair because we're comparing Lucy to Adobe, which is an unfair comparison because the only thing that we have the same is is that we're the same language, but we're different servers, we're different models, we're everything else. So it's a bit unfair. I would say, like, compare Adobe to, I don't know, IBM WebSphere and how do they charge that model on the cloud? How you know, like I wouldn't be saying like, oh, well, Lucy's free because they don't. Essentially, we don't care about what you run, right? But IBM WebSphere, I'm just that's a. I don't know if it even still runs, but how does Red Hat charge for enterprise Linux in the cloud? How how do they? That's what if I was working in Adobe, that's what I'd be looking at. Looking at my comparison, how does Windows charge for its services in the cloud? I'm sure they've got a licensing model for the base. Uh, for okay, maybe not Windows, but let's say. SQL Server, how do they charge for the instances in that? You know, it's shockingly that. expensive quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you're going to be doing that uh, and paying enterprise licenses, probably will do. But, and it's mostly um, just the Postgres or MySQL or Maria. Yeah. Right. That's um, a great you see, point. It would be good to have like a comparison table of how do different people do cloud licensing from mm, the open yeah. source tools that, that basically are not charging in the cloud or, or charging. But see, Ben, what's your all? what you're all going to be facing when you're moving to Docker. So lots of stuff that you need to consider. <laughs> mm. What's the, uh, yeah. what's the story nowadays with Lambda functions? I know Pete Freitag, I think oh. put together something. I don't know if yeah. that's yeah. can generally. Yeah, can Pete, run? Pete put together a thing. It's easy for Pete to use. Some other people have found it challenging to, get started with once you've got it started mm. it runs fine yeah mm. and then it's basically very cheap because you're only paying by the minute or whatever a, a amazon web services charges you mm. um, we should clarify that's called fuseless and if you, you know, yeah, yeah, it, that's it we'll get yeah. it in the notes later i assume, I assume. and then i think yeah. what you're getting at ben perhaps was um cf 2021 when it first was being announced and pre-released it, i was involved in that pre-release and there was Lambda, and let's be clear, by the way, there's Lambda, the language feature that we talked about earlier. That's not at all related. We're talking about AWS Lambda, which is um, serverless functions effectively. And that was provided for in CF 2021. Originally, you were going to be able to deploy CFML on Lambdas, and that was really cool. And then when it came out, they pulled that. And I guess Ah. it, it was probably another licensing thing, you know, where they just realized that there wasn't an easy way to manage that. And it's too bad. So, so to be clear, for now, CF does not itself provide a way to run CFML on Lambdas. It does provide support. And I did a blog post on this last year. They, they added back the ability to call Lambdas and have specific language functionality to integrate with running Lambdas, which, you know, someone could argue isn't needed. But that's mm-hmm. the point is you can't run CFML as Lambdas. And again, that's another one that absolutely people will go, well, I'm going to do Lucy for that. And, you know, that's understandable. Totally understandable. How do you charge but, per server and serverless, mate? I mean, that's the <laughs> thing. Well, you need to charge per minute or per hour or whatever, right. basically. And that's what they do. Adobe does have the AWS, right. what do they call it, AMI. AMI, yeah. Version. yeah which and that's worth pointing out. Does. You mentioned it in passing earlier. You know, it's the Amazon machine image, AMI. And there's a Lucy AMI as well. Um, who somebody put that together? Uh, was it Ortis? Um, yeah. I guess uh, that was Demon. Demon. Uh, yeah. Demon did that, and Ortis did that as well. Mm. Right, so but the uh, but and so there is a, a Lucy AMI, and and so the point for those who don't know it, it's like you could spin up a VM in Amazon, and just like it's an image of already pre-configured running environment with Lucy on it or with Cold Fusion on it, and for the cold fusion it's commercial but it is very cheap it's it's paid per second kind of pricing and it's really really uh, low price so for some people that would be the desirable way for them to achieve lower cost licensing and especially monthly price license some people really want to pay a subscription model versus the traditional yeah. you know perpetual if I remember, license. It's, it's only like a cent or two above the base price isn't it it's like of what? It's uh, of of the that AMI image, 
because you have got like the the base price of like whatever machine you're running it on. Right, you always have to pay for that. Yeah, yeah, you know, so but it's, it's only like a cent or two on top of that, so it's not. Like yeah, it's not much. That's price. the thing is you're paying for the infrastructure to Amazon, and then you pay a small amount to uh, to the company. I forget the name of the current company that's involved, but but there's an intermediary who mm-hmm. manages it, and then they pay. You know, Adobe. It's it's you know, it's like a lot of stuff. There's always middlemen, and so in the end, you know, Adobe isn't making a mint off of it, but it is at least a model that's very very different and could suit some people and. I, but to see, I don't know that it really applies to the um, Lambda deployment either. And that, you know, that part is still, I think, unclear. So anyway, that's just another example where, you know, with Lucy, you don't have to worry about it. It's no charge. Move on with your life. And that that is nice. There's some circumstances where that just makes more sense. And I don't deny that. And I wish that, again, they would work on that and make it more clear because it's losing some people. I mean, but just to that. wrap up the licensing thing and let's move on to a yeah, another good topic. Point. My 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 thing. vision for licensing, you know, a lot of enterprise customers are fine paying money for software, but right. it has to be appear to be fair and it has to be easy to understand. And currently the Adobe Adobe licensing isn't and the loosing licensing is very easy to understand and seems to be fair. So um, <laughs> sure is. and that's how I've I taught, said that to Mark in the interview yeah. I had with him, and you know he yeah, doesn't control Mark. licensing. Yeah, yeah. you Mark's know, Mark's just Mark's imagine, Mark. just imagine the time and money that we saved by not talking about licensing. That was the clever <laughs> absolutely, <decision. laughs> yeah. very clever. So let's talk about uh, ease of installation and hardware because that's changed quite a lot in the last few yeah. years. Mm. So uh, I to- think I, I'll, I'll chime in because. Uh, I uh, my role is doing DevOps includes installing a hell of a lot of software and deploying a hell of a lot of software. So back in in when dinosaurs had hats, you'd have to go next, 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 right? And which port you wanted to do it, and next, 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 next. You didn't read what what the next was. You didn't just whatever. You had fifty screens that you just went there, and then like localhost eighty eighty or whatever. That uh, you have your ColdFusion server and stuff like that. I think that's changed a hell of a lot now because we don't think of individual servers as pets, like thing that you like lovingly set up, and then you have this monolith there that that's your one server. Now you have hundreds of servers, right? So I think installing things easily, configuring things really easily is the way forward. It's 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 the only way forward in 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 that i mean there might be a, a massive market which i don't know which is about uh with hosting providers and how they use uh i've forgotten the name of the software uh cpanel for example to set you up with databases and stuff like that but um is now that's changed kind of a lot like now it's like the easiest way like lucy express is is a, an example of of how I install stuff now, right? It's like super simple. It's untar something and run a command. I think I created a Docker image and this is not showing off in three lines of code. Install Java, download and extract uh, Lucy Express, run Lucy Express. <laughs> Ta da! You know, that, that's, and we can deploy that really easily. I think we have changed in, 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 in over the last. Yeah, we have to we have to also say we have gone through a lot of evolution there. You know, when you started, it was as Mark said with the installers and everything. And I remember how much time we spent getting the Rilo installers to actually run through and having installers for Linux, for for yeah. uh, Solaris, for Windows, and what have you. And they get less and less important because servers become less and less important because they get destroyed and built uh, in a. Um, amount of seconds so what the first thing that we did there was when you go to the admin you actually generated all these application settings snippets and you can even completely export the the lucy administrator settings into an application cfc which you can then just use in your application cfc so that you don't have to use the administrator at all anymore and then the next step was using cf config which is working with adobe cold fusion and lucy as well so just a point there, Lucy 6 will completely be um, basing off of uh, CF config or the, that's the syntax of CF config. And our config will go from XML to JSON. And so that was an, an additional step. 
then the next thing was um, using command box. We introduced the the um, executable version of, of Rilo back in when was it? 4.1. And based off of that, Command Box has been built, which is an awesome tool and is started very easily. So that's another step in, in uh, installing CFML very fast and easily. And now what is very important when you do all these deployments, these script deployments, is the startup time. The startup time used to be, if I remember correctly, in the 90s, it was about two minutes when you restarted the server. Oh, then it went that, down. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, then it went down to, I don't know, let's say 40 seconds to stop and start Cold Fusion or Lucy. And now we're down to about two seconds, one, two seconds. That's still slow to me, but uh, we're still working on getting those things down to, I don't know, half a second, one, 0.1 second, so that even on Lambda, it can, it can be used almost without any delay. You know, you mm. just send a request and it immediately comes back. And so, to be fair, uh, to, to be fair, yeah. Gert, a lot of that is is the serverless container. Like the serverless yeah. container is pretty fast, but even getting Lucy started up is like right. Really but the enough. latest, yeah, but the latest Red Hat uh, things. What is it? Well, no, Quercus is starting up in zero point zero six seconds, so we can't use that excuse anymore. So uh, <laughs> there's still some way for us to go. But anyway. <laughs> Oh, all good. So uh, I'm very happy where the whole direction goes towards because I don't want to deal with any um, any Lucy administrators that I forgot to close down uh, because you know you used to go to uh, to Google and search for slash Lucy slash admin CFM. Ta da! There you go. Let's break in. I mean, I think um, both Adobe and Lucy have really cut down on the minimum install size. I, I don't know what the Lucy install size is, but I think Adobe's down to from a gig to that about two hundred megs. If I maybe Charlie, you know the yeah, I wanted to chime install. in on that because it was it related to something Mark said earlier, and and then Gert said there's two points there. I think because people who have not been paying attention to what's happened, for instance, with CF twenty twenty one would think that everything we just talked about was was Lucy advantages, and they were for a long time. But some good news is that in 2021, first of all, there is now a zip installer. So it's like the Express zip installer in Lucy. And you really can just download a zip and start the engine. So that's finally there in CF 2021. That's good to see. And then um, <clears throat> the uh, CF config capability that command box adds, we should be clear, CF config is a command box um, extension, which, as you said, works with both Lucy and CF. <clears throat> in CF 2021, they added the roughly the equivalent. I don't, I'm not making any judgments. I'm just saying the same concept of a JSON-based ability to export and import admin settings. That's now in CF 2021 built in. And then also the smaller... Um, install yes. So that what Michaela was getting at is that in CF 2021, the core engine in CF is now just a, a couple hundred meg, if that. And then, like with Lucy, as long had CF 2021 has the ability to do package management and add in or not add in things. And the full installer just adds everything, and the zip installer basically adds nothing but the admin, and you have to choose what you want to add. And there's even uh, a feature in that tool, it's called CFPM for package management. That CFPM tool, you can point it to your code and it will analyze your code and say, okay, well, based on your code, you need these packages and it'll provide a file. And then when you start up CF, either in the admin, you can tell it. And then this is really important because some people don't know this is possible in the Docker images for CF 2021, there's an environment variable and you can point to that file that was created by the CFPM tool that says you need these packages. So instantly up comes the image already pre-configured with the packages that you need. <clears throat> or you can provide another environment variable that just lists the name of them if you know what they are. And then also that Docker image for 2021, you can point to that JSON file and it'll just pull in the admin settings. So I just want to say that things have evolved so much. Um, and, and I don't say that to be a partisan at all. It was more back to my point about how things are just modernizing. It's taking time for things to catch up. Sometimes one gets ahead of the other. And that's you know too bad that it's often portrayed as partisan. And that's just our nature in the world these days. But you know, for it's sure. all getting better. That's I mean, good to I, see. I agree with you, but all of those features, right, have been around 
in the community for a while. And now uh, we've said this before, the reasoning behind why Adobe does it like this. But instead of supporting Forgebox, instead of supporting, you know, all, all of us coming together and saying, this is how we do package management so that the, the community gets better. They always like throw like the community under the bus. The community does something, right? And then the, Adobe goes like, that's a great idea. We're going to do it our own version. So now whatever you were doing for months or for years as, as a product. Mm -hmm. So it's still what it's doing essentially is getting all those heroes in the community, the people that are shouting out about the product, about CFML, about everything else, and just throws them under the bus because now Adobe does it a different way. So we have are you talking about like the CF setup versus the CF config? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, well, I know many, many examples. CF config is an, is this, an orders thing, so they're not going to bundle it in. I don't know. Maybe no, they can I really do like, I, I, This is why I pre prefixed my, my thing. I understand why they're doing it, but understanding why that does not negate the consequence to the community, right? But is it a negative consequence? If someone wants to run CF config, they still can. Sure, but you haven't added to the community. As an organization, your habit is to go like, that's a great idea. We're going to do it in there. There's not in, mine. In, Their habit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, no, I'm not I, blaming I you think Adobe all. could benefit from being a bit more friendly to third-party vendors and and contributors. But hang on, you forgot and about add, the solicitors, you know, the solicitors. Well, that's, yeah. that's, I think that's the mentality that needs to shift. They've got this closed source legalistic mentality going around. Not everyone, but, and they do tend to like, oh, well, let's bring it in. And maybe they have good reason for that. I, I don't know if there's some liability. I, I, I can, uh, I can un completely understand why they do all of that and they want to do their product and the product's going to be the best thing. But I'm saying the other consequence of that. I am yeah. one of the people that have been thrown under the bus of this. Yes. Like with CF Eclipse, right? We put right. in all of our heart and soul into that. We even talked to, the, to Macromedia at the time. So can't blame Adobe. And they were like, yeah, we're going to do it, going to do it. And then they went off and did something completely different. And it's like a few months later, CF Builder came out. So, all right, thanks. That's a great, thanks. Right. Yeah, I think and moving forward, it'd be better if they could kind of build on what was done in the community, support what other companies have done, make their stuff interoperable with it, don't create yet another standard. Right, um, exactly. And um, I, I know, I mean, just to name one other example, you know, Intercourse <coughs> Fusion Reactor, great product for monitoring your servers, and then Adobe comes out with performance, uh, you know, PMT or whatever it is, performance and monitoring and tool. Fusion Debug, same thing. Yep. Yeah. So I, to me, that short-sighted behavior. Um, but but anyway, they have their they have their reasons. Just one thing I wanted to mention: the basic Lucy image, which with no extensions whatsoever, is twenty-four meg. <laughs> wow, that's amazing! Uh, great work, guys. Yeah, Reduce. Yeah, of course, of course, Java needs to be installed, which is another one hundred and seventy. Uh, well, I, but I, that's. And by the way, yeah, that no, the way really, the one, one comes, it comes with Java. So if you subtracted that, it'd be even smaller. They were kind of in the same. In the same yeah, it's great to see. Yeah. And by the way, let me just say about all that, just because because sometimes I don't think people understand where I'm coming from. I agree with what you just said, Mark, totally. I kind of am in the middle of saying, look, I, and I want to make sure everybody understands this because people think I'm somehow an Adobe insider. I have that zero, zero impact on any decisions like that. I've never been a party to discussions of should CF Builder have been built on CF Eclipse? No, I was not a party to that. You know, should should the the PMT be built based on Fusion Reactor or not? No, I had nothing to do with that. I'm like everybody else. I just see this stuff drop all of a sudden. Where I kind of see my role is kind of like the CF librarian. I just want to make sure everybody's aware of what all the differences are and what the options are and how things are evolving. Because sometimes people that are in one camp or the other tend to only see what they see. And I keep wanting to say, whoa, 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 there's, there's things are changing. This is here as well. And you're right. Some people would go, well, I don't want to hear that Adobe has CF set up in 2021. They should have put in just CF config somehow. I agree. Again, I have nothing to do with that decision. <laughs> I just want to be clear. So when you guys, not you, everybody, when y'all hear me, I just want you to know where I'm coming from. I just support people every day solving problems and in the community. And I just try to stay on top of what is the situation and make sure everybody's aware of what the situation is. 
kind of without judgment. I mean, because because I, I just look at that as problems I can't solve. You know, like I, I don't seem to have any influence over those kind of decisions. And I'm just saying from my personal experience, if anybody thought otherwise, no, I don't. So I kind of give up on even the debate sometimes because it's like there's nothing to do about it. Let's just deal with what we got and hope that through enough discussion and things becoming obvious, Adobe would move. And, uh, and sometimes we've seen that. Like That's why I was highlighting those changes in 2021. They're really pretty significant. But some people would go, yeah, well, I'd stop using CF back in CF 11. That was 2014. That was eight yeah. years ago. It has changed so much since then. And some people don't even give it any consideration. Um, to be fair, Charlie, I think I have more influence on Adobe or Lucy has more influence in, on Adobe than you. Because yeah. if we introduce something Absolutely. which over time pays off, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's, kidding. you know, that's, and isn't that an interesting testament to the open source model? I mean, one could argue they look at what works well. And they go, okay, that's a good idea. Let's finally fold it. And see, some people would go, well, that's just them stealing ideas. Well, okay, that's one way to no, see it. it's not. <laughs> Hang on, that's not true. Because I always have to say, we wouldn't be here without Adobe, right? Or without uh, right, a layer or macromedia. <laughs> it goes both ways. <laughs> so, and I always have to say that this is hopefully a relationship that is kind of begetting each other. So we're kind of benefiting yeah. both from each other. Well, and um, we're not there. I'm, I'm from the outside. Mark competition is good right market yeah, yeah. forces are good and if you oh, wow. if, if you have like competition which is apples and oranges like php and cold fusion i mean adobe's cold fusion right that's not a good market force because they're completely different markets and stuff like that yeah sure we are building websites and what have you but if we, both lucy and adobe are, are competing in a space in which we have that it should benefit both products, right? That's that's the whole point of market competition. Um, Is it this competition? Sometimes this cooperation. You know, we mm -hmm. all talk with each other. Cooperation, interchange, competition, and also I just want to say from the enterprise point of view, having more than one vendor producing a CFML engine. You know, I mean, the two main ones are Adobe Cold Fusion and Lucy, but I mean, there still does exist Blue Dragon and various other things lurking around. Um, but my point is they, de they don't like having a single source of uh, failure. You know, if it was only Adobe Cold Fusion and didn't have Lucy as well, then they get a bit nervous. Well, what happened? I mean, people are always asking me this. What is Adobe going to continue supporting this? Of course they are. They've got a 10 year commitment to this, but if anything terrible happened and the whole country mm -hmm. of India suddenly disappeared and floated off into the Indian ocean, um, Lucy would still be here and it's open source guys. So like your investment in all those man years and decades of programming in CFML is, is secure. Yeah. So, and, and I think we should uh, take away the microphone from Ben because he's talking too much. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, what, I, what's your view on this, Ben? And I so also want to recognize that we came to the top of the hour and I think good, yeah, that's something you had that. to leave for. No, I have to leave at half past. So I'm so okay. So we can right. continue this exciting conversation. <laughs> so I have uh, another t ten or so minutes in, in me before I have to go and fix okay. a cup. <laughs> so one thing I just wanted to say is I think of everyone here on the call, as far as understanding servers and server setup, I know by far the least, probably by an order of magnitude. I get uh, flustered when I have to install something. And I remember back to the days where I had to have uh, IIS or Apache running, and then I had to install Cold Fusion. And then there was some sort of WS config that I'd have to run and that like never quite worked right. And then I'd have to include the right thing into my Apache conf D file or something. I don't know. And it was like a miracle oh, every yeah. time it worked. Um, and command box was like a, complete game changer for me it 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 you know to be able to open up command box and do server start cf engine equals acf or cf engine equals uh lucy at 5.3 or whatever and and just suddenly have multiple versions of cold fusion running at the same time that really unlocked a lot of experimentation opportunity for me uh in a way that it had never really been accessible for someone as much as I love CFML code, I know so little about servers themselves, and uh, mm -hmm. and that was just a real game and changer you, for me. And you shouldn't, and in my opinion, you shouldn't, you know, because that is something that 
um, the, the DevOps folks or the engines should provide for you, make it easy for you to use or make it easy for you to script and then just go and have fun and do the things that you're, you can do best. We have folks like Charlie helping us if we have some issues with installing, tweaking and performance or whatever. But if it's about building applications, you know, if you're, if you're writing a book, you're not, you don't need to know how to actually um, create the cover and how you actually sell it on online or whatever. You need to write the book, right? So typewriter is all you need. And that's, yeah, so that's my take on that. But as uh, as you say, the experimentation, I think I've got to take my hats off to command box because it allowed you to now just install whichever version. Hey, I'm I'm doing some code. How does this work on something else? And and I'm going to get this wrong because there's a couple of sites, but the CF, uh, try CFML or CF, try CFML, yeah. uh, try CF.com. That you're able to just change the engine and say, like, okay, if I do this little thing, how does it work in different engines without having to do, as you say, that whole installation process, which, as you can see, I have no hair because of having done that for many years. <laughs> I've done all the pulling of the hair, like removing, doing that. So let, let's move on to uh, the CFML engine speed, scalability, and performance, because I think this is a, a, boy, a place that CF language has always shined that you can produce easily produce scalable apps assuming you don't write really dubious database code as mm -hmm. ben can probably tell you about because he's been writing all these blog posts about cool stuff in the database layer um but the cf language itself does all this stuff behind the scenes right to help mm -hmm. you scale up so what well, um, that's something that that sometimes, sometimes is... people have criticized cold fusion for but it's not the cold fusion engine it's it's how good the code is and how good the database structure yeah. is what the good thing is, it is abstracting a lot for the user. So let's just take writing an email, writing a um, or writing a query. How much is involved there? So the ease of use there is absolutely awesome. And what we have done as well is try to keep the engine as memory and resource hungry less or so very low in those in those areas, so that we can scale and that we can uh, Dockerize it and run many pods. Um, working on that code. And what I do is I sometimes, for example, what I do a lot is doing ETL, meaning taking big files and shoving them in the database. And I did some some tests between uh, doing it on um, in Bash versus CFML. And CFML is a little slower, obviously, but still um, we are managing to, to uh, parse and insert data uh, in gigabytes um, in minutes, in a couple of minutes, so, so 10 minutes or something, um, where we were able to download it, break it up, targe zip it and upload it to S3 within a couple of minutes. Uh, and that's really large amounts of gigabytes in, in size. And that's what I love. I mean, it has been evolving so much over time. And of course, the computers have been becoming a lot faster. But still, what I like is that the difference between going in pure Java and and having Lucy on top is not that big, right? Or having CFML on top, it's not that big. So I love it. And there's also like some things that, uh, and Charlie is the person to really talk about this, but usually the performance bottlenecks in your app is not the engine, it's not Adobe mm -hmm. Cognition or Lucy. It's usually the mm -hmm. external resources, your database query, your the the HG, CF HTTP call that you do somewhere. Usually, the code itself it can loop through mm -hmm. thousands of things. Is and I did a whole bunch of uh, speed tests years ago, uh, which I got uh, in a blog post, uh, and this was comparing like Adobe creating components and Lucy and and I think Blue Dragon at the time. And it's all like, well, it's, it's, you know, you're going downhill with the wind behind you and it's the right time of day and the temperature's just right. You know, that's the kind of difference that you're going to get because we've gotten to the stage, I think, especially with CFML, that we've gone over uh, a lot of the bottlenecks off the, off the application itself. We've had this it's long enough that we've taken this out. So now most of the bottlenecks is something else. It's yeah. like an outside yeah. resource. Well, and, and one thing that I wanted to point out is that Cold Fusion uh, brings to the table a lot of developer ergonomics that that make things very easy but come at a cost, and and that's a I think a trade off 
that that you take on as a, as a developer. So like the fact that you can invoke methods with both named and positional arguments, so the fact that you can dynamically at runtime change the methods that are actually in a component, or you can do a lot of meta programming reflection and 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 your query tags know where your DNS or your data sources are defined. Like there's a lot of stuff that becomes really easy because you don't have to do a lot of low level things that you have to do in other languages that might be faster, but then require you to do all of those low level organization and syntactic uh, choices yourself. So uh, there's, there's a, t- I, I get a little frustrated when I hear people say, well, you know, if you run this in Golang, uh, you know, you could, you could run uh, 10 million concurrent threads but yeah, but then you have to do a whole bunch of stuff about managing those threads. Whereas in Cold Fusion, I can't run 10 million concurrent threads, but I can open up a thread tag block and call it a day. And I don't have to worry about how that gets managed. So there's mm-hmm. there's trade-offs and, and those trade-offs have a performance cost. Absolutely. And also since performance is actually my thing, <laughs> in <laughs> very many times, very many times when I visited clients, I actually had to disappoint them by updating Java or Lucy or whatever. Yep. It wouldn't fix their performance issues. 99% of the cases, the issue is between the monitor and the chair, right? Okay. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> but well, the very, very the how, do we tune the, how do we tune that? person between the monitor and the chair yeah, good well yeah well yeah Takes exercise uh, I, healthy eating yeah. good sleep well mostly, mostly a lot of podcasts. Some, yeah and in ben's case it's lifting podcasts. a lot of weights at the gym so i see from his social <laughs> posts yeah. and and very often it is when you show them something they go aha uh-huh, that's the reason why it's like that and then they go oh sure now i know it's just like if somebody pointed them an index of a database table oh that's how it works, right? Mm-hmm. It worked with my 20 records. I mean, that's a very famous uh, phrase everyone has heard, right? Works on my machine. And um, so mostly the issue is not even uh, as remotely, as Mark said, as remotely uh, connected to the um, engine or to the OS or to the database server. So all of those are really maybe 1% to 5% of the cases. And some of them are blogged about by Ben, right? When you find out, um, that something is weird going on in the background. So sometimes it is the engine or sometimes it is, but that's very rare. Yeah. Right? But I, the, I've the never one... seen a case in tuning servers or code where it wasn't the bad written code database or an API call or something else. Uh-huh. It's never been that you can't get Cold Fusion and the JVM to run. Maybe, Charlie, you've come across, oh, uh, but I'm sure 99% of the the time yep. the cold fusion engines do it going great uh, right and i like how mark said earlier it's rarely about the code it really is very rarely about the code i mean sometimes it is but it's usually like you said some third party thing you're talking to which could be the database could be uh cfhcp or api call out to something else and cf appears to be a black box and when i say cf i mean lucy and adobe cf can seem to be a black box. And that's where I'm such a big fan of monitoring tools, whether it's the ones that come with the engine and each have something or third parties like Fusion Reactor or C-Fusion or Java monitoring tools to be able to see what's going on. It's so valuable because what I'll tell you is that in my experience, the biggest contributor, if it's not those things, is, you know, I won't say misconfiguration, but maybe letting the default configurations not be changed and they're not appropriate for what you're doing, which could be how your code's written, and how it's deployed. But also the biggest contributor to really bad problems in my observation is always unexpected load. And again, people don't know. They, they just put their server on the web or put their code on their server and they think, okay. And they don't realize that Google's banging it every day 10,000 times and Yahoo's banging it every day 10,000 times. And then along come your users. And then somebody's trying to steal your content and somebody's running monitoring tools. And all these things together can be really excessive. And there may be something in your code that's contributing to tripping over that excessive load. Or there may be something in your configuration which doesn't suit that. Or maybe there's a need to do something more like caching. And so those are sort of things that with the right tool, that's what I love about the tools is with the right tools, you can find it where the problem is. And then you can talk about what's the best way to fix it. I mean, it's usually the marketing department sending out that email to your whole user. That's a big contributor. Absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. 
And I can give you an example of some something where the engine was the fault, right? So the fault yeah, of Lucy, for example, was when you're using the tag CF info for a file, you can do CF file action info, and it returns you the information about the file. Problem there was back in the days that it was also doing a hash of the content, like an MD5 hash. Mm -hmm. So if you're doing that on a 20 gigabyte file, you can wait for a minute, right? And um, I never understood for a long time why is the code waiting before processing that file? I was really scratching my head until I figured that out. So the better way to do it, and this is this was the solution that I had back then, do a CF directory with a filter on that file only, and then you have that info that you wanted apart from the MD5 hash, which I didn't need anyway, right? So sometimes it can be the engine, and we have changed that in the meantime, but sometimes it can be the engine, but it is really very rare. To, to just piggyback on the idea of doing a CF directory, uh, and I don't know what CF directory does under the hood, but but I can imagine it maybe does some sort of like an LS command if you're on a Unix machine. Yeah, and, sure, and, and something I think like that. That's that's one of the things that is often kind of a the the unsung hero is that we can dip down into the lower levels of the architecture from Cold Fusion, whether that be running uh, executables with CF execute or dipping down to the Java layer. And Java layer has like, you know, 20 years of incredibly battle tested libraries at our fingertips. And that's, it, so it's, it's, it's never that you're just with CFML, you're with CFML plus everything below it. And, uh, and there's just an incredible amount of functionality there. Absolutely. Anything else um, anyone to wants actually, to add bef to performance? Because I think we do need to wrap up. So maybe we should just wrap. Um, and, you know, there's lots of other things we could talk about. Maybe we can get together uh, for another roundtable another time and talk about, you know, the the uh, community support, podcast, tech support, security, a big issue, documentation, uh, updates, and all kinds of other topics between the different engines. But Maybe, Gert, you can tell people how we can reach you online if people want to find you. Well, they can just come to Razor.ch or shoot me an email at Gert at Razor.ch. Or I'm, I'm not doing that much of, of um, um, you know, social media anymore because, you know, first of all, you can uh, – social media is very patient, so whatever you write there is permanent and they will <laughs> haunt you for life. So rather not saying anything is good and – yeah, sounds like I'm a coward there. But anyway, it's I have way too many things to do than deal with social media. But just shoot me an email, gerd at rager.ch or gerd at district. Right. And we'll, we'll put that in the and show notes on the sure. Terratech podcast show notes page, uh, along with all the other links. What about you, Ben? How could people best reach you online? Uh, you can email me at ben at bennadel.com or at my blog, uh, bennadel.com. I do a lot of writing there or Twitter, bennadel. Excellent. And Mark? Um, uh, you can just try a random domain with my name in front of it, because <laughs> that's generally where I am. But uh, Mark, Mark. Your full at, name? Yeah, Mark at commandhq, cmdhq.io, or Mark Drew on Twitter. And I'll probably respond much quicker because email is so last century. <laughs> and Charlie? And I love email. So I'll, like, like Ben, I'll say you can reach my email at charlie at careheart.org. And, and you'll have these in the show notes oh. and on social media at careheart. Nice and easy. C-A-R-E-H-A-R-T. And speaking of the show notes, I know, you know, before we lose anybody here in the group or also people listening, I think you'll make maybe mention this, Michaela, but I want to really point out to everybody listening. There's a lot of things we didn't yet get to talk about because this topic is so big. The show notes we put together have lots of information. There are entire subjects that we didn't yet talk about. And one of the ones I want to make sure we at least highlight for everybody is community support, because there's ACF community support resources, and there's Lucy support resources, and there's things that support both engines. And we've got those listed with links in the show notes. So don't feel like you're alone. Don't feel like there's only one place to get your answers. There's multiple places and sometimes there's real value in reaching out either in different places or just watching, lurking what's being said in different places because you sometimes get quite a different take on things depending on where you look. Absolutely. And you can find uh, me, Michaela Light, on uh, terratech.com. Uh, I blog a lot. We publish podcasts. I'm also on LinkedIn and Facebook. Little bit on Twitter. <laughs>
All right, guys. Well, thanks so much for doing this. A uh, lot of illuminating information. Have a fabulous rest of the last day of quarter one in 2022. That's when we're recording this episode. It will be released in a week or two. And, uh, you know, Viva Cold Fusion may, you know, all the different versions. <laughs> I, I, I need to have a lightning in my hand. <laughs> yes, the Allaire lightning bolt of Prometheus, which was the original yeah. name of Cold Fusion, right? Prometheus. Right, and- right. Um, and maybe no, we can do it. a part. Maybe we'll do we can it. do a part two of this so that we can cover. I'd love to do a part two. two. Yeah. You know, maybe we can schedule that through email or in Gert's case, sure. it will have to be some other mechanism. And I can tell <laughs> no, you the email I still have. We're going to need to do that because there's going to be a flood of comments of things we didn't think to say <laughs> or we said wrong. <laughs> so we'll definitely have to do a part two. <laughs> and of course, you could use Twitter to send me hate because. That's what happens on Twitter. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Love you guys. Bye bye. See you all. Bye bye. Get detailed show notes on today's episode in your free CFLI Modern Cold Fusion Guide at terratech.com. That is T E R A T E C H dot C O M. Viva la CFLI Revolution. 